McLaughlin, McLaughlin from Indianapolis. The subject is the future of the past, and he'll be talking to us about restoration. He is, uh, I suppose, the only architect in, in, can you hear a whistle? Well, I'll try to adjust it in a minute. Could you adjust? Uh, he's probably the only architect in Indiana specializing in the restoration of architecture. This is a field that, uh, with I suppose the youth of America, we have never really uh, understood that we should preserve our buildings, and I think we're, we finally come to the decision that we must. There is now a one curriculum in the College of Architecture in America, which uh, I think it's in, Tennessee, in uh, Virginia, specializing where you can get a degree in the restoration of architecture. Is that right, Rob? Uh, mm -hmm. In uh, the Bay Royal Academy of the five curricula we have there, one of these is the restoration of architecture, and, and it's very big business in Denmark. Mr. McLaughlin attended John Heron Art School and received awards there in art and photography. He traveled and studied architecture in Central America and in Europe. He served with the United States Navy CB in Europe during World War II as a camouflage specialist. He is a life member of the United States Navy League. He is a registered architect in this state and seven other states, holds a certificate with the National Council of Architectural Registration Board. He joined James Associates, if you remember David Eaker, who was our second lecturer this year with James Associates. Raw is not another one of the associates in that firm. He joined the firm in 52 and became a principal in 1956. He is a member of the American Institute of Architects. He served on the National Committee for Historic Buildings and is preservation officer for the Indiana Society of Architects. He is a member of the advisory committee to the National Park Service for the Historical American Building Survey Program and the, the HABS program, uh, I think most of our sophomore students have seen is coming up on their roster in the spring. And so that our college of architecture will be participating in this preservation program. He is a member of the Society of Architectural Historians and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Currently, he is consulting architect for the restoration of the Old State Bank in Vincennes, the Market Street Restoration in Vincennes, the Old Opera House in New Harmony, the Morris Butler House in Indianapolis, the Lockerbie Square Restoration Project in, in, in Indianapolis, and the Blackwood Conduit House in Terre Haute. Mr. McLaughlin. When I recently received a letter from the professor, I indicated that I very seldom use microphones, that my voice carries well without. I got a letter back from him and he said, no one's voice carries well in our class of hub. We're <laughs> going to use a mic tonight, so we will try. And had I known he was about to read that obituary, I wouldn't have sent it to me. <laughs> You know, we're undergoing quite a change in the architectural scene today. No longer are we satisfied to produce young architects without teaching the history of architecture. And I'm glad to see that Ball State is starting off on the right foot. It makes me feel good, it doesn't make anyone else feel good. But truly, the Architectural heritage is the seed that 
brings forth the harvest of the future. And as we look back over the years, we look at our architecture, we look at our buildings, we look at things as remote as a simple shelter that a man put over his head centuries ago. And we find that reflected in our architecture is really the history of the type of life we live, our art and culture, our economy, and our general well-being. It all goes into the period of life. We realize right after the close of World War I that we went through a period in this country and we looked at our architecture and we call it hospital clean architecture, sterile architecture, and we're all very satisfied at that time because there was somewhat of a priority that brought about this sort of design. And as we know all through history, the design of anything we do has a direct bearing on the type of life we were leading at that time. So what we're doing today is trying to write the history of architecture, and we're doing it in a rather fascinating manner, mainly through research. We know the history of people, we know the history of many other things, but architecture has been sadly neglected, except in the case of what we might call museums. Well, there's a great deal more involved today in, in salvaging period architecture than just to salvage as a museum. This costs a lot of money, and by and large, most of the museums have already been salvaged except in the cases where perhaps some dignitary lives there now and we can't do much about it until it passes away and hopefully he will turn out to be the right kind of guy to warrant that sort of a renovation. But today we're concerned with resurrecting buildings from the past, creating a future for the past by creating a contemporary use for an historic building. In many cases, we call this reconciliation, or we call it restoration with reconciliation. Because to save these buildings, they have to function, they have to become living structures, they have to pay their way in the community and pay their tax on the tax roll. So what are we doing about these things? Well, we're finding across the country that some people are pioneering this movement, willing to take the step daring to spend the money, and perhaps to create something with character and atmosphere with a reflection of days gone by, and acknowledging some of the architectural facades that perhaps a hundred years from now, none of us are here, we might be hopeful that we'll receive the same recognition. By and large, we're interested in saving the best of the past. Yet, we wouldn't look at this with a very strong scope if we only saved the best of the past. We must also consider, in restoration work, salvaging things of a typical nature that might be typical of a period, one of a kind, even a freak piece of architecture that is all a part of that history. I think as we look around today, we can see more and more of this coming to light. Here and there, we're also amazed to find that some people are doing a pretty bad job of this sort of salvage without proper professional advice. And frankly, this is where the architect comes into the picture, where the arch archaeologist is involved and the historian. And there are several cases where this man might be and fit into all three categories. The very self. You know, I heard a definition recently of an architect rather shocked me, but it made me think. The statement was that the architect today is a coordinator of prefabricated forms designed by engineers, industry, promoters, and the advertising industry. When you stop to think about this, they're not too far from wrong. How much good architecture do we really have around us? Really good architecture. Are we getting art into architecture? Well, we should, and I think we're striving towards that direction now. If we are to save the future of architecture, we're going to have to start bringing the craft back into it. We're going to have to have respect for the carpenter, the brick mason, the metalsmith, 
and all the people have played such an important part in building our past. But today, with these many prefabricated forms that I mentioned, we're doing just barely little more than what that definition expounded, the architect and the coordinator, prefabricated forms designed by somebody else, and that's not a very clear picture. Not a very enlightening outlook for the future. Also, a partner of mine was told by his wife the other day, as she sat among a PTA meeting, at which time a school plan was presented to the PTA group. We weren't the architects, unfortunately. And this gal was also an architect. She's an MIT grad, but she's rather unhappy and upset by what she heard in conversation behind her. And when something like this, one man looks at the other and he says, you know, he says, if you want to make money, you ought to be an architect. You ought to go to work for an architect. As if going to work, going to work for an architect is like going in trying to get a job as a salesman someplace. He says, no one makes any more money than architects and does no or nothing for them. Well, my partner's wife felt like standing up and killing this guy. But she restrained herself. But folks, unfortunately, this is the attitude that a great many people have toward architects. They only see what's on them as a blueprint. And those things can be burned up. If you go out and build a building for them, they might have a different outlook. So I mentioned this strictly as some advice to you students, the professors, the architecture today isn't all as rosy as it might appear. It's not all the dream that we envision. Architecture is also a business, and the biggest business is public relations. You've got to get out and educate the people. You've got to sell them. You've got to make them look at the feeling. Well, as the Dean mentioned, my specific interest is in period architecture. The only way to practice period architecture is restoration. You don't believe in recreating duplicates of the past for modern purposes. But there are still a great many people, especially in domestic architecture, that would rather do period architecture for their residents. And unfortunately, they don't usually know what they're talking about. They refer to colonial, early American, and usually French provincial. And if you were to put down a French provincial piece of architecture, a picture, or take them really through one, they probably wouldn't like it. They wouldn't be satisfied with it. So, back to the restoration angles, we're trying to bring to life again some of the buildings that once stood on their own two feet, expressed themselves in their particular period, which at that time might have even been called contemporary. Not only are we interested in isolated projects, we're in interested in area renovations, which is even more important. I've examined and studied a number of these all over the country and in Europe, and believe me, we have something to, to guide us in this country by looking to Europe toward the learning that perhaps we are a little slow in reacting to. In Europe, the word restoration usually comes after a war, during a bombing, when a building is destroyed. The people didn't destroy it. In contrast to our country, where we've remodeled the dickens out of our buildings, especially our business sections, on the first floor only, leaving the original architecture spire up above it, and perhaps is the best architecture the building's ever seen. We put glass fronts on buildings, we put aluminum fronts, we put Pullman fronts, prefabricated porcelain enamel panels, store fronts, and what have you. And it's kind of sad, because underneath all that perhaps is a building that architecturally expresses itself to a greater extent than these applications that have grown on this building in more recent years. Europeans unlike this situation, have 
preserve their buildings through one single method, maintenance, continuing maintenance from the time the building was erected until this very date. I can show you slides of building five, building five, five or six hundred years old, still being used for shops, living quarters, and almost looking like a fairy land because they're so well maintained. Again, there are many reasons for this. The Europeans do not have the financial assistance to continually change such as we do in this country, but they also have one other attribute which I think is good. When they build new, they build around the outer ring of the city. And perhaps until recently, when some of the American influence has crept into the picture, even destroying some of those elements. But as a tree grows, so did some of the Europe, or most of the European cities, the new around the old. And I'd like to graphically illustrate for you this evening some of these examples that will best tell the story on the slides in color. And starting in Europe, bring you back to America, and then finally in Indiana, show you what we have, what we're trying to work with, what we hope to accomplish, and some of the things that have been accomplished. And I think you can see very readily that architecture in many forms is on the move and it's certainly in the hands of young people like yourself to uh, make architecture alive again, and create something we'll all be very proud of in the future. And as the Dean said, the National Park Service and its HABS program and you'll have a lecture on that, I think, several months from now by James Massey, Massey who is chief of HABS. There are summer programs available to architectural students with top honors, by the way. The program is seemingly much in demand because you get paid to work and learn. You may be in the Virgin Islands, you may be in California, or you may be up in a lonely spot in Maine. Majoring, doing research, photographing buildings of architectural merit. And in turn, these documents are recorded in the Library of Congress, in the Smithsonian, the National Archives, and perhaps even the National Register. It's a very worthy program, and Jim Massey, when he comes to talk to you, will have a great deal more detail about it. Well, if I'm going to execute the light switch, I'll try some of the slides. Finding anyone's way back here, sound off. You know, every year, thousands of Americans traveling thousands of miles and spending millions of dollars go to Europe and many distant lands to enjoy the visual delights of the foreign landscape, historic monuments, many of the things we remember as a child in our old geography books. And we're ever amazed at some of the things we see from the metropolitan areas to the remote villages. And suddenly we return to America to wallow in a mire of ugliness which surrounds so many of our cities and landscape. Typical scene USA, your town and mine, in this case Atlantic City. And would you believe at any place you take that picture along that street it won't look much different. Clutter of signs, ugliness, decay, lack of design or care, even the spaghetti of our clover leaf leaves a great deal to be desired. And then as we approach any town in Indiana, you can almost say this 99 times out of 100, we're again met with the billboards marring the scenic landscape that may lie beyond. And we find perhaps often at the end of the road buildings such as this designed by the prefabricator. Here, housing for the aged. Can't you imagine putting your aged parents in a thing like this? Just bursting with character in life. <laughs> and in contrast to our chaos in signs, 
How about the German approach? Let's put all the automobile signs in one spot outside the limits of Bonn, Germany. All you need is a little place to pull off the road, examine your sign, look up your agency. And can't you imagine any place in Muncie or Indianapolis, for that matter of fact, where two pots of geraniums would last very long on the end, on the abutment of a bridge? <laughs> well, it kind of leaves you wondering, it leaves you guessing. Put your mind to work. What is the difference? Why, on this 500-year-old bridge in Switzerland, can those two pots of geraniums exist? Does it begin on the drawing board? Is it the respect taught over the many years for the craft, the fine carving and marble, wood, and masonry? Is it the simple mason repairing granite cobblestone on a pair of street? Or maintenance-wise, two gals operating a beauty shop in Germany that scrubbed down the front of their, their building. Here's constant maintenance for you. How often do you see that in this country? They have little, but they use it to its fullest extent. Well, today in our nation's capital, behind closed doors, such as our own Octagon, the home of the American Institute of Architects, Architects, designers, historians are meeting to discuss the need for preservation of some of our heritage. They're discussing the wrecking bar and bulldozer. Is it really necessary? Does it need be everywhere? And here on Lafayette Square in Washington, just opposite the White House is a good example. And there is the question mark. Where does it strike next? It might even be the White House. Although this is a National Historic Landmark, well maintained. We never know what lurks around the corner. Could even be Independence Hall. And today Independence Hall is undergoing about its fourth restoration. Through modern technology and methods, many of which are similar to those used by the FBI for uncovering facts about buildings, materials that we never knew before. And we're able to pick a date and restore the building in a pretty authentic manner to that period. It could even be Christ Church in Philadelphia. But there is hope, there's a, light, there's a ray of light, and around the corner, such as in Philadelphia, who perhaps helped pioneer restoration of the old town. Here lies an example of coexistence, the old town under the shadow of the skyscrapers, now being restored and brought back to life. A man like Charles E. Peterson, former architect with the National Park Service, now specializing in restoration, pioneered this project in Philadelphia on a little street called Spruce Street in the Society Hill area. Buildings such as these, 10 years ago, could be purchased for two or three thousand dollars. Today, to buy one of these un unrestored, such as we picture here, you're talking about thirty or forty thousand dollars. And upon restoration, you're looking at a building that's valued a hundred and up. And this is right downtown Philadelphia. Domestic architecture, shops, professional offices, all within walking distance of the skyscraper in the background. There's been a fabulous growth in Philadelphia. And it's a delight to walk up the narrow alleys and streets and capture the atmosphere of the early architects and builders that made these buildings possible. Imagine today what it would cost to duplicate that entryway, whether it be in wood or marble.
Well, we're, we're all familiar with historic Williamsburg. When we look upon Williamsburg perhaps as a restoration. And perhaps there's as much reconstruction there, if not more, than there is restoration. But nonetheless, it speaks for its past, and it speaks for that period. And if you examine these buildings in great detail, you will find that great care was given to the way brick was laid. Here showing the Flemish bond, careful detailing of cornice and eaves, scale and proportion in the buildings, character and color, woodlawn plantation. And these buildings aren't threatened. They're either owned by foundations or by trusts. In the case of woodlawn here, the National Trust for Historic Preservation has as this one of its properties. Old Salem, North Carolina, a community restoration based on the religious group of the Moravians stemming from Germany. They created this village in Old Salem. And today it rests as a National Historic Shrine. Note here the half timber construction, also noted in a slide I showed you there of a little German village. A great many people look at this and they think application, but it's not. And this is actually the structural system of the building. Timbers with masonry work between the timbers, forming the exterior walls and in many cases interior. These people even knew how to insulate buildings and they used what they call Dutch biscuits by wrapping mud around a wood shake reinforced with straw. It not only provided insulation against the elements, but it acted as a good sound bed. And no further away than New Harmony, Indiana, we'll find exactly the same application. New Bern, North Carolina, Trine Palace, restoration, $3 million to restore this structure. Not only the buildings, but the grounds, the fine gardens, beautifully manicured, abstract designs, many of the things we even strive for today. But note always that maintenance is the key word. We talk of our national landmarks and we refer to organizations supporting them, such as the federal government, state organizations, national trusts and foundations, but how about just every day, your town and mine? Is anything being done just on an individual basis? Schenectady in New York tried it. They're restoring many of their buildings. They're putting markers on the structures, designating the date, this one about 1800, and look at the different doorways and note the change in the period of architecture. Here's one about 1840 and another one about 1890. All strictly speaking for themselves and representing their specific period of architecture. And then as we look down the tree line street, we get something that looks like order. We get a peaceful at atmosphere and an inviting look into the back. And then man like this, whose name is not important, had a vision. He tried to, tried to encourage a little village up near Atlantic City called Smithville to restore its town, an old fishing village. No one was interested, no one thought it feasible but him. So he finally went to a bank, sold him on an idea that he had purchased a thousand acres of ground seven miles away, and would they loan him the money to buy up all the condemned buildings and restore them for a contemporary use. So he bought them, some of them didn't have roofs. He hauls them out to his new site, puts in an artificial lake. Some of the buildings he hides under the trees, props them up on concrete blocks, and restores them one at a time as funds became available. A little church, an apothecary shop, all restored to their own period of architecture, but all now functioning in whatever light 
may be required to make this little village click as strictly a commercial enterprise. Here again, business entered into the picture. He couldn't get it done through an historical society, through a foundation, so he decided to do it on his own. And today, this man's got a gold mine. Several fine restaurants. He believes in one thing, quality. Quality in his buildings, his food, his service. All signs are graphically illustrated, hand-painted, and represent what might be had inside. Lounges to wait while your food's being prepared. If that doesn't do, try the pub. And then finally, when you dine, it's in an atmosphere in keeping with this date. The people that refused to cooperate are now working for him, incidentally. <laughs> well, again, back to the sea of signs and clutter. Some of the things we have to work with, some of the things we contend with in our daily life, and these are harder to get rid of than anything I know. Meridian Street, Indianapolis. It's a damn. <laughs> but we do have a few things in Indiana. Our old first state house at Corbin, beautifully restored and preserved, property owned by the state of Indiana. And perhaps the most ambitious restoration undertaken during the last five or six years is the restoration, and this is a nasty word, home of the first president of Indiana University, built in 1836, of the late federal period. Andrew Wiley was born in Washington, Pennsylvania, in a rural community. He preached there as a Presbyterian minister, later became president of Washington Jefferson College in Washington, Pennsylvania, in 1829, was talked into coming out in the Midwest to take over Indiana University. 1836, with plans and ideas transplanted from the East, he erected this house. We had a part in this thing, and the research, I think, was as much enjoyment as actually the building renovation itself. We found excellent records on this property, even to the extent that we found the, the records contained the original building contract and specification between the owner and the builder. And the owner had agreed that if the excavation clay from the foundation of this building was suitable for the making of bricks, the owner would furnish the cart and the horse to haul it, but the contractor would have to have the bricks made. And they were made there on the site. We have simple little bills of sale, such as 15 hand-carved rosettes to occur between the top and bottom of the casings, the doors and windows, 35 cents apiece. We have 10 turned rosettes, 10 cents apiece. Things like this are very interesting. We found a great many of the things were bought from the general store because the bill of sale would show so much flour and sugar along with a keg of nails. Well, as you get into these things, they become more and more fascinating. And I think perhaps my real interest in this area is the research angle. The things we find and the things we learn, that were done by hand and with limited facilities. Northern Indiana has its old lighthouse. This was owned by the National Park Service until two years ago, at which time they deeded it over to the Michigan City Historical Society for restoration. They gave them three years to raise funds suitable for this work, after which time, if this was not possible, it would go back to the Park Service. So far, they're doing pretty well. And you know, Greek Revival and Classic Revival architecture in the Midwest has always fascinated me, especially when a client comes to you and says, I want to do a Southern Colonial house. Little do they realize that there were more revival 
pieces of architecture done in the old Northwest Territory than they've ever seen in the South. But they don't want to believe that. Down in, in uh, Orange County at Paola, Indiana, I think is one of the good examples of Greek Revival architecture, the Orange County Courthouse. And we find these things all over Indiana. Here down at Jeffersonville, a building that's now used by the Red Cross, unfortunately. <laughs> and as we go on west to the southwest corner of the state, we meet with the little town of New Harmony, which certainly has deep roots in the history of Indiana, being settled about 1814 by the Raphites, or preferably called the Harmonists, a religious group also stemming from Germany, settling in Pennsylvania, and then coming to Indiana about 1814. This group believed in celibacy, they believed in communal living, and during a very short period of 10 years, at which time they resided in New Harmony, they did some amazing things. The typical harmonist house, which may be frame or brick, is constructed, although not visible on this slide, similarly to what you saw at Old Salem and also what you saw in the old German village, the half timber type construction, over which they placed either brick or siding and always the door entered on the side, never the front, which is a part of their religious belief. And although there are many stories why that is so, they're all stri strictly assumed. Once a family's children became of age in New Harmony, they moved into what they called dormitories, the man in one, the women in another. This building was built about 1816 originally a dormitory, but the facade you see here is certainly a long way from 1816. This facade, which was added in 1888 to convert this building to an opera house, and at this date, under restoration, will be restored back to the 1888 period. Now it's interesting to note that economy was a byword at that time, just like it is now. We won't do anything we don't have to do because it costs money. The rear of the building is harmonist. The midsection of the building represents a period of about 1856, at which time the uh, dormitory was converted to a so-called thralls theater. And then 1888, when business was flourishing, it became the opera house. This is owned by the state of Indiana, and hopefully will be restored and in operation by midsummer of this year. Again, those of you who have not looked over some of our fine Southern River houses along the Ohio, Madison, Aurora, Evansville, should by all means do so. Again, classic revival architecture flourished. The wealth was here displayed, the craftsmanship certainly visible. In this case, the Lanier House built about 1844. In two cases in Madison, two very fine handmade stairways, both circular, however, in one case, the outer ring of the stairway borders on the wall. In the case of the other house, it's supported only at the floor levels and does not touch the wall on either side. My favorite house in Madison of this type is the Shrewsbury House. This was built a few years later in 1849 by Captain Shrewsbury, an old riverboat captain that got a corner on the salt market. And at this time, of course, they used salt for preservation rather than seasoning. And he wasn't about to be outdone by Mr. Lanier, who created the former mansion. So Mr. Shrewsbury built this fine home. And it's hard to visualize the scale of this building unless you put someone in the picture. Then you're suddenly aware that you're looking at a doorway that's over 12 feet high, inch and three quarters thick, three and a half feet wide, and it's only warped three sixteenths of an inch in all that time. Well, why? Materials were select, craftsmanship was good. 
and they believed in doing things right. But I almost defy you today to put a door in your house that doesn't at some time work. Green lumber. Well, who designed those two mansions? An architect named Francis Costigan lived in Madison in this home, which he also designed for himself. And he kind of believed in scale, mainly vertical scale. And some say he was the originator of the sliding door. And again, I think this is perhaps a rumor. Anyway, it makes a good story because the first or the front door of his home was a sliding door. Also, several other buildings he did in Madison have sliding doors. And they slid into a pocket completely out of sight. The Judge Jeremiah Sullivan House in Madison, Indiana, I think is a good example of what we say when we refer to restoration and reconciliation. Here's a project that's been restored on its exterior as authentically as possible. Likewise, it's first floor and part of the basement because the basement had the kitchen. The kitchen, the food was prepared in the basement, brought up to a serving kitchen on the first floor or a warming kitchen and from there served to the dining room. But the upper two floors of this structure are apartments. And in those apartments is realized, or from those apartments is realized, enough income to more than support this building. Any excess from that amount goes into a common fund, which in turn is put right back into more restoration. The Harrison House at Vincennes, Indiana, again, our early roots in history. <clears throat> is what we would call a restoration on a museum scale. Funds have not been available over the years to do this adequately, but as funds come in, projects are accomplished. More recent, the restoration of the old state bank, the second bank in Indiana, was uncovered several years ago, having been encompassed by three buildings that were built around it, and there they stood for about 70 years, covering up a fairly nice classic revival building. This is the alley view. The portico that this building once had was torn off with the exception of two columns that were we found later embedded in the additions that were later added to the structure, but at least it gave us a clue to where they were their diameter, the emphasis on the column, the profile of the base, and all these things went together to help put it back. And today, from that same view, it looks more like this. It's interesting to note that the building across the street, which was formerly a, a residence called the Ellis Mansion, was designed by the same builder, not an architect, and also the same man did the fine church in Vincennes, which is rather a focal point at the end of 2nd Street and across from the Rogers Park Memorial. You might also note that the bank appears to be heavy in scale, whereas the house is a little more delicate. And again, this was a result of a, the original bank, which was logged, burnt down. People demanded a strengthy building, a building that they felt their money could be deposited in without fear. And so this was the result. Today, the contemporary use of this old bank is an art gallery. The state owns the building, a local art group such as uh, an art association uses this building for display. And the scale in the building is excellent for this purpose. But other things are happening in Vincennes. Again, for commercial reasons, if not for historic or both, a group of businessmen band together, formed a corporation, and bought a city block. And they did it quietly and secretly. Reason being, there's nothing quite as grand as demand to raise a price. These buildings were purchased, and after practically everyone was involved in this program of restoration of this block, they began work. They started to uncover things that they never realized existed. For instance, the former slide, the second building, which has the Maytag washer sign on it, 
gives the impression that that facade was of about the 1920 period. We go in the building, we note the ceilings, we find they're probably of the 1880 vintage, and we're aware suddenly that the building's probably been remodeled at least two times. But upon removing this facade, we found the building had no third floor. Underneath all this fake front was a building dating to about 1830 with a pitched roof. And what you see uncovered here is that building behind all this false front with a standing seam metal roof. Well, what are we going to do with this block? It was just about ready to go. Several of the buildings were condemned, and in almost every case, there had been no occupant on the second and third and fourth floors for some 50 or 60 years. Only the first floors had been remodeled from worse to worse to worse. So today, we're removing everything that exists of those many remodelings and converting back to what our research tells us that those buildings look like in their original state. Now, it's interesting to note that the building on the far left, the three-story structure, was bought for $2,000 from Dam. It's now producing an income of over $400 a month, granted apartment above and a loan company below. We have, again, reconciled ourselves to the fact that these buildings must serve a contemporary use. They must produce income, and lots of it, because there's an initial investment of some dollars put into this project by some 15 or 16 businessmen. So underneath the umbrella, the length of the block, we're doing an arcade of many small, tiny, specialized shops which will produce quality merchandise. And we found only quality merchandise sells in this sort of facility. The upper floors of these buildings, again, are apartments, professional offices, shops, and so forth. These slides were taken last summer, and I think if you go down there today, you'd see that perhaps 60% occupancy and completion is now visible. Well, what other uses have we for vintage architecture? Here's one built in 1862, Lafayette, Indiana. Twelve years unoccupied. Price tag between seven and nine thousand dollars. Recently purchased by a group of young businessmen offering a service to some 600 newspapers over the country in advertising, advertising layout, mainly to newspapers that have no commercial art department. Within this facility now, we have an art department, executive offices, shipping department for this whole business without sacrifice to the architecture. Starting in the attic, the art director converted this space for his studio and darkroom. The basement, very much like the house in Madison, had a kitchen. Again, the cooking kitchen. The old original floor planks, even the original color of the woodwork and the old plaster, Again, this was restored almost to its original purpose. It's still a kitchen and dining area. And the occupants of this building went to the extent of finding the genuine antiques, refinishing them. You might say, well, again, functionally, where is everything? Well, the ice box is in that poplar cabinet on the far wall. The sink is in this cabinet without injury to the original character of the structure. And what do we do with the president of the company? Well, we took over the front parlor, opened up the fireplaces, and a couple of the local jokers, the sidewalk superintendents, came through and said, well, 
Those fireplaces were closed up because they wouldn't work. You're just wasting your time and you're going to get dirty besides. Well, they got dirty all right, but the fireplaces worked fine. And it was a delight to go on into, a, into this building during their open house and find two or three of these fireplaces going, creating again the atmosphere of the past and still adding warmth to its present day use. In the exterior, strictly with a coat of paint, cleaning the brick, rebuilding the shutters, washing the windows, returning it to its original facade, save the roof. The roof had been put on not too many years ago and still in good shape, but I think when they wear this one out, they'll go back to the wood shape. This was all done for approximately $45,000. There are two complete heating and air conditioning systems in the house, and without sacrifice to vertical ductwork, we have one system in the attic, one in the basement, so we only have vertical ductwork involved. So far, satisfactory. Well, I think Indianapolis could be pointed out as perhaps one of the areas that we've been as negligent in as any in the state. We've lost some fine structures, among which is our first federal building. This saw the wrecking bar and bulldozer several years ago, and on this site today stands the Union Federal Savings and Loan Company. We have the original, or copies, I should say, of the original may, uh, working drawings of this building. And believe me, they are a piece of artwork. They even detailed the hardware, the shutter hinges, the door locks all done in pen and ink. I'm going to send a copy of this up to Charles Sappenfield for your own archives. I think students might enjoy seeing what the earlier draftsman did, and in this case, 1856. Not too long ago, this Victorian mansion saw the bulldozer, and now the ground is level. However, before this building was raised, our Historic Landmarks Foundation was given permission by the State Highway to go in and remove anything of value in this house at our expense, of course. So we've salvaged the old fine mantles, some mirrors, woodwork, balusters, handrails, and what, what have you. However, the hardware, which we wanted very, very badly, was either stolen or taken out of the building and sold long ago, as was the case of the chandeliers. This was the old Albert Fletcher Mansion on North Pennsylvania Street, later known as LaRue Supper Club. The woodwork in this house, in many cases, is made of three types of wood, cherry, bird's eye maple, oak, walnut, bird's eye maple inlaid into walnut. Beautiful stuff that we will sometime use in another restoration of a similar period. Another little building of perhaps Gothic revival architecture was removed just about a year ago. And this for a number of years was a business, but they did a pretty good job of preserving it in its original character. Structures such as this, the Harrison House in Indianapolis, one of only eight National Historic Buildings on the National Register, and that's kind of sad. Only eight in Indiana, and you can just about name them. However, just next week in Columbus, Ohio, there will be a meeting conducted by the National Park Service and the National Register to orient, orient people in the Midwest concerning the new application forms and the new methods of recording historic structures. It's a rather involved detailed thing. It all starts with what we call HABS, recording first the structure, getting it on a state inventory, and then evaluating the building on its merit. The Harrison House, of course, is not important because of its architecture, but naturally because of the, the president that once resided there. However, it might be classified as a typical example of a rather moderate, Italianate form of architecture. I've mentioned buildings that have stood on their own two feet for years, practically since their inception. First as a house, now as a mortuary, but nonetheless, 
other than the addition on the rear, which I'd like to cover up, this building has been maintained in its true character, at least on its exterior. Here again, Italianate architecture. Unusual periods and styles of architecture exist. This one's not threatened. This is the home of the Construction League of Indianapolis. If any of you up and coming young architects end up in Indianapolis someday, you'll use that facility. Here's a little house, again, of a unique nature, kind of a composite design. However, it took a fancy to Eli Lilly one day, he bought it and restored it, and then gave it away. Completely furnished in the period. And like Mr. Lilly, he likes to have his buildings used. So the front four parlors of this building are available for civic clubs, luncheons, teas, and so forth, whereas the, the rear of the house is an Episcopal diocese. And perhaps the most recent restoration in Indianapolis, and one still underway, is the old Morris Butler House at 1204 Park, owned by the Historic Landmarks Foundation. This falls into the category of restoration and reconciliation. The gardens, the exterior, the first floor in its entirety will be restored according to our research and furnished in the period as authentically as possible. The upper two floors at this date are rented. Our apartments and my partner, Dave Meeker, who gave one of the lectures up here earlier, resides in that second floor. Dave is a strict contemporary designer. And I think you'd find it most interesting to see what Dave's done with the scale he has in his apartment with contemporary appointments and a few good quality, well-designed antiques. Again, this income from those two apartments plus an apartment over a carriage house will more than support this building, although at this point we have over $125,000 invested. Again, it's completely modern as far as its mechanical system is concerned and as well disguised as we can possibly do it. These slides were taken about a year ago and if you were to go by there now, you'd find the garden has already been restored. And in the case of the exterior, it's I'd say 95% complete. Dave's ambition is to acquire the third floor apartment one of these days, put a little in, uh, inward stairway in the tower some way because he wants that fourth floor area of the tower, make an uh, ideal studio. Unfortunately, the bachelor lives up there and doesn't want to give it up. <laughs> Perhaps some of you have heard of a little community called Zionsville down in Hamilton County near Noblesville. 1960, it looked like this, a pretty bleak scene. Again, people, and I say people because this is what it takes. No matter what the architects say or do or recommend, it still takes people to get the job done. They formed a chamber of commerce, studied their community, decided that if they didn't do something pretty quick, if it wasn't any more than cleanup, they were going to die. And about a year ago, that same little community was taking on this life. Unfortunately, they got the idea they wanted to go colonial. So we let them go colonial. It was an improvement. It's better than what they had. And in conclusion, I want to bring to light a project that's now in the news in Indianapolis, and one we're rather deeply involved in with a great many other people. It's called the Lockerbie Square Project. This is a, a community under consideration for area restoration for contemporary use. Here in the heart of the slum of Indianapolis, we have a rather interesting scene. We see the old brick sidewalks laid in herringbone, under the peeling asphalt pavement, we have a cobblestone street. We still have a bit of green between the pavement and the sidewalk. We have full grown trees, and you can't even get that in a modern housing development. But here's one that 
dates from the turn of the century backwards to about 1860. Minor buildings, nothing pretentious in this area, perhaps except the Riley home, which is, of course, a National Historic Landmark. One of those eight that I mentioned. And the whole community could look like this if it was given some care and attention. Instead, it's an area of 75% Southern Appalachian winos and bones. So we've got a problem. It's not the building, it's the people. What are we going to do with it? Well, here's the second most important house in that area. Again, it's been modified as far as changing the window sash. But if you look real hard, you can see again the reflection of the late federal period. Built 1859, which is kind of late for the federal period, but nonetheless, we classify it in that category. This house will be restored. It's all, also owned by the foundation. It's the home of the first merchant tailor in Indianapolis. They made Union Army uniforms in this house during the Civil War. And it has a rather unique history in a kind of a simple way. We own the monster next to it, which burnt down the last, this last Christmas. We bought it for $7,600. It had eight families living in it. We had it insured for $10,000. The first time Indiana National Bank's ever handled a piece of property, the insurance company paid the whole ball of wax, the whole $10,000. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> we were going to tear it down anyway. <laughs> We're just fortunate that fire didn't spread to the house we're trying to save. Also within the Lockerbie area are many minor houses, as we prefer to classify them. Little structures like this that may look kind of unimportant. But nonetheless, they were important at this time in the development and the business in Indianapolis. These little houses, if you examine them closely, they reveal some rather interesting millwork details, their casing, the little interesting panel work that lies in the jams of the recessed entryway. And these little buildings can make fine little three or four room apartments or even shops. The Lockerbie community will be a area encompassing domestic architecture, shops, professional offices, and a few museums. Business buildings such as this, still in fairly good shape, have, have rather interesting facades that are worthy of salvage. And let's reflect a minute on German Village in Columbus, Ohio, which is an area of about the same period, an area that jumped, jumped the gun and has been doing very well over some three or four years with over 3,000 buildings of like character. German Village Society is restoring their little community of buildings, such as the one you see here in Lockerbie, and you see in German Village, after their restoration and some modification, have again become living structures. Brick streets, brick sidewalks, paralleling in time and period. Note the brick, note the slate roofs. Almost every one of these houses had a slate roof and it's still on. It's drawing artists and architects and responsible people into a community that formerly was in a sad state of decay. And here and there they're creating where buildings are not worthy of salvage, best pocket parks. Doubles, single dwellings. Again, almost invariably, slate roofs, very few frame houses. And beyond the house itself, the garden. Just as important, tiny, the husband's dream to minimum grass cutting. And in conclusion, my favorite of the group not the house, the garden. And this garden is 30 feet long, 10 feet wide, one end comes to a point at the other. It's a giant wedge. But here's some imagination for you. 
Very simple, easy to maintain, colorful. Explain a little bit of privacy. And I'd like to say, in, again, in conclusion, that perhaps this is what I refer to when I say creating a future for the past. And let me insert that one phrase I used a while ago. That our heritage is the seed that brings forth the harvest of the future. And I keep remembering that because one night after a similar talk, a chap walked up to me and after spending an hour at about something like this, he said, but I still don't understand why we're saving these old rattle trap buildings. <laughs> and I said, well, you're putting me on the spot. If you haven't discovered this by this time, I suggest perhaps that you enroll in the, the course of architecture at Ball State and talk to the history professor up there and maybe with six years ahead of you or five, whatever it is, he can instill this into your mind. Thank you very much.